as we start this season of Advent, brothers and sisters, um, the Christian church all over the world uh, begins this season, this liturgical season that we acknowledge as the time where we prepare our hearts and our minds to remember uh, the birth of Jesus the Christ. Now, plenty of people celebrate Christmas, um, but not all people celebrate it for the same reason that we do. So I would just want to remind us that uh, Christmas is not just a commercialized situation. Say man, somebody. That Christmas for the people of God, for the people of Christ who claim Christ, it, it means a little something different. And so as we start this season of Advent, it is a time where we are called together to reflect on uh, moments that fuel us every day. Moments and gifts that fuel us every day. And that's what the Advent wreath is for. Every week we will light another candle as we draw closer to the time when we remember Christ's birth. And we remember the goodness of the gifts that God offers to us. Hope, peace, love, joy. And boy, did I need some hope, peace, love, and joy as I drive through the city of Dallas. I need a lot of peace. Say amen, somebody. Driving can be a tricky task for someone like me. Driving in Dallas can especially be a little tricky if you have the temperament of somebody like me. Just wink at me. You ain't got to say amen. You see, brothers and sisters, every vehicle, every vehicle, I don't care if it's a Tesla, a, a Dodge, a Nissan, a, a Pinto. I don't even know if they're making those anymore. But, but whatever you ride in, every vehicle has what we know as blind spots. Blind spots. Uh, some new drivers might not be as familiar with blind spots as the rest of us, but, but they're the areas that are hidden that keep things that are critically important from being seen, like another vehicle. And I know some of us have fancy cars that give us a ding and a dong and a doop, doop, beep, beep, boop, boop, choop, choop. I sound like mumble rap, right? Whoop, doop, choop, choop. But <laughs> some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But these fancy cars, they, they give us a notification that there is something in our blind spot, right? So, so don't get too close to the left or right because there's something on either side of you. But if you are like uh, my dear friend who decided to turn that off because it bothered him, only to end up in a mel of a hess during a car accident. Blind spots, brothers and sisters, they're the areas of the road that cannot be seen while looking forward or through the rearview mirror, or sometimes even in your side mirrors. And when we have blind spots, when we're on the road, serious damage can happen to you, to me, and to others when something or someone is in your blind spot. Say amen, somebody, I'm going somewhere with this. Just as every vehicle has a blind spot, I believe so does every Christian. Every person who is desiring to take their lives in a direction that is different or better than where you were before, you will find out real soon that every last one of us who are seeking to be better versions of ourselves, we all have blind spots. And our blind spots are those areas that are important to our Creator. But for us, or many times out of our sight. They're the things that we forget, and sometimes they're the things that we just flat out ignore. Do the things that really matter to God ultimately matter most to me? That's the question that leads you closer to discovering your blind spot. I, I wish I could say that I'm an excellent driver with no shortcomings, but I don't like to lie when I'm standing up here. I don't like to lie at all, in fact. But but I, can, I get it. I understand what it's like to be a driver in this city. In fact, I remembered one day as I was going through my notes and thinking about this, uh, one day when I was trying to do something that I no longer do because my brain has made it very clear to me that that's not how I have been wired. I really don't think any human is wired this way, but some of you all have, have become proficient in operating in the manner I'm about to speak of while others of us have acknowledged, acknowledged, accepted, and can tell the truth, we should not be ever doing this. And that's called multitasking. <laughs> multitasking. As I was driving one day, I was multitasking a million things on my daily to-do list. 
I, I was leaving one meeting, trying to get to another meeting across town, only to discover that I should have left sooner. Say amen, somebody. Because I was then, I found myself stuck in the heart of rush hour traffic in Dallas, Texas. I don't understand why it's called rush hour, because to me, nobody ever seems to be in a rush but me. <laughs> and I could tell that I was behind someone who decided that it was their time to chillax and talk on their phone while they were driving. And so I thought, you know what? This person is in the passing lane. They're in the way. They're going less than the speed limit. I ain't asking you to speed, bro, but can you at least go to speed limit? So instead of waiting on this person to catch a clue, I decided in my haste to pass him. And, and I moved to my right to pass him. And out of nowhere, say nowhere, out of nowhere came this loud, honking, bum, bum, blowing horn. And then the finger waving began, not for me, but from the car that I did not see. The driver was furious, furious. And I'm thinking, where in the heck did this car come from? See, it was in my blind spot, and I'd almost crushed his sweet little car. It was so cute. I think they call them smart cars. And, and it was such a cute little car. And after I collected myself, I thought, well, bro, next time, maybe you will remember it's not so smart to be driving next to a wild woman who is late for a meeting. You and your little smart car. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that experience helped me realize one thing. I need to get a bigger vehicle. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Seriously, what I did realize is that the problem wasn't my car. The problem wasn't homeboy's car. The problem was me. I was so focused on my schedule, on my agenda, on my meeting, on, on my air conditioner, on my songs on the playlist. I was so focused on checking my lipstick on, and on thinking about what I'm going to fix for dinner. Or I was so focused on my life and where I had to be that I had become distracted and lost complete sight of where I was to some very critical things around me. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is I do it all the time and I got a real strong feeling so do many of you. See, the reality is that we get so focused on the hustle and bustle, particularly during this holiday season, right? The hustle and bustle of trying to gather things together. We, even in ordinary times, get so, so focused on the hustle and bustle, obtaining and maintaining certain things in our lives, in our culture, in our social scenes, that the things that should be the most important begin to fade away. And what should be central becomes peripheral. And the really important values of life, they then get pushed so far to the side that eventually we become blind to the things that should be central. Like loving God. Like showing justice and mercy. Like chasing after God with our whole hearts. So today, I want to invite us to think about this question. How do we... No, make it personal. How do I stay focused on those truly important parts, those truly important elements of life, particularly in the midst of all of these distractions that are going on around me? How do we stay focused on the important elements of life, even in the midst, even in the middle of all of the distractions in life, so that we can constantly remember to keep God as the central focus? Well, today I want us to examine some of life's dilemmas by gleaming from a section of the Bible that perhaps many of you are not as familiar with. They're called the Minor Prophets. We're going to look at one today. The minor prophets, you know, I love that we are biblically literate. Say amen, somebody. Amen. I know y'all thinking, what kind of dress is that she got on? Well, it's a dress I shouldn't have wore to preach, but say amen, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't test out our clothes before we, that's your twin. Oh, my sweet Jesus, good Lord. I was like, what the WTH? I literally thought my eyes was playing tricks on me, y'all. I'm so focused on my dress. Hey, twin. Okay. Uh, all right. 
I digress. Let's get back to the subject. Look, see, distractions, distractions all around us. <laughs> the minor prophets. <laughs> the, the, they're, they're, no, but the, the minor prophets are books in the Old Testament. And they're called minor prophets, not because you need adult supervision to read them. You don't have to be 18 or older to read them. They are not minor because they, they had a bad batting average. That's not why we call them the minor prophets. Uh, they, they, they are not minor. <laughs> You're so corny, Shannon. Shannon. I mean, where do we get these hecklers from? I just want to preach. It sounds like I know something, but people keep interrupting me. All right. <laughs> So, as I was saying, they're not the minor prophets, prophets because they didn't make it to the major big leagues. They're not, that's not why they're minor. They are minor because they are shorter in length than the major prophets' books. So, don't get it twisted, friends. Just because something is shorter doesn't mean it's less impacting <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Without these five-inch heels, I'm pretty short. But buckle up, I'm like dynamite when I am on fire. Say amen, somebody. Amen. It's important that we don't do a drive-by of this particular book that we're going to look at or any of the books that are in the Minor Prophets collections because they do have uh, words that will impact us in our lives today. Their messages are essentially calling us back to the things that are most important to God, things that are near and dear to God's heart. Things that we have become blind to. And if we continue to miss them, then, then we can cause serious damage to our lives and to the lives of those around us. See, without these messages of biblical truth, we only experience living our lives just scratching at the surface. Never going deeper into what God desires for us and for our lives as we live here on this place called planet Earth. I, I see Chris here. I don't see Brandon and Maddox, which is probably, oh, they're in the back. Okay. Brandon, oh, right. Brandon and Maddox. Can you both wave your hand so people can see you both? Great. That is one of our church's most amazing dad-son dynamic duos. Um, these gentlemen, which wasn't brought to my attention until a few weeks ago, if you've ever sat anywhere near them, you probably have noticed this, but since I'm up here, I don't really get to sit out there to notice what's happening. But it was brought to my attention that Brandon and Maddox, who are both amazing artists, they literally sketch their sermon notes out in a picture form. They, they draw them out in picture form. You should see some of these creations. When I preached about Noah and the big fish, oh, my goodness, uh, Brandon's sketch was quite amazing. Uh, I believe it was last week that Maddox showed me a picture of what he believes Jesus looks like. And I thought, my good Lord, kid, this is amazing. But today, uh, Brandon, I am going to need your permission if you do want him to sketch out what we're going to talk about. <laughs> because what we're going to talk about, while he can read it, I can't put a stop on him reading the Bible. I don't know what his uh, imagination might bring forth when he starts to sketch out what we're looking at today. So, so just go ahead and give me a little, it's okay, Pastor. Okay, cool. It's okay. So Brand Maddox, go ahead, sugar. If you want to sketch out what Pastor's talking about today, your daddy said it was all right. If you will, turn with me to Hosea. It's in the Old Testament. Hosea is one of the minor prophets. Very short book. Uh, I was teaching uh, my, I was the fill-in as the chaplain for the day when Alex was in fifth grade. And uh, I decided to let the kids ask me any question you want. You know, there's, there's answers about everything in the Bible. And um, they're, they're shooting off questions. And I'm like, yep, let's look at that. Let's look at that. I'm like, there's everything, everything in the Bible from, 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 you know, God's love to brothers fighting to, to um, uh, one brother stealing another brother's wife to prostitution. And the kid raised his hand. He said, what, what page that on? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> Go home and ask your mama what page that's on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I said, it's in the book of Hosea. So Hosea. 
Hosea. It's right after Ezekiel. If you have an actual Bible, if you have your smartphone, just Google it. The book of Hosea. It's a significant book and a very, very unorthodox book. It's so unorthodox that it almost seems bizarre. Hosea, let me give you a little backstory on who this dude was. He's a young preacher. He's a young prophet who came on the scene more than seven centuries before the birth of Christ. His name comes from the same Hebrew root as that of Joshua, or its Greek equivalent, Jesus, meaning salvation or to deliver. That's what Hosea means. And Hosea lived, as we are told in the first verse, in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reigns of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Ezekiel and during the reign of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. Jeroboam was one of the wicked kings of Israel. And the nation was going through a very difficult time. Sounds like today. Say amen, somebody. But it was going through a difficult time back then when Hosea was on the scene preaching. It was a time of great political um, upheaval, my God. It was a time of growing moral decline. It was a time of factions and, and sections of people fighting against one another. My goodness, sounds so familiar. People were living it up back then in Hosea's time. Oh, yeah, they were kicking it. They were getting lit. They were getting turned up, as we might say, and, and didn't have much time for God. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was ready for the weekend in Hosea's time. <laughs> so will you listen to the words of Hosea, which is found in chapter 1. We're starting right at verse 2. But I'm going to invite you to go home and read the entire book. It's not long at all. You can get through it during a commercial probably, but it's not a very long book. So read it in, it, it in its entirety, but for today, let's start here. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, this prophet, God said to him, <laughs> Hosea, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. P.S. Prostitution has the same meaning today as it did in Hosea's time. This, I'm not about to give you a different definition. It means exactly the same. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Oldest profession on planet Earth. Let's keep going. This will illustrate, God says, how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods, little g. So, Hosea... I want you to go marry a prostitute. So here goes Hosea. He marries Gomer, the daughter of Deblum. And she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. Uh, this ain't in the Bible, but I did wonder every time I read this, did he have, like, he ain't got no app. How he find this prostitute? Did he just go <laughs> line up all the prostitutes and pick one? I mean, like, I don't know. Maybe the Lord said, and that one. I, I don't know. But anyways, he picks Gomer. And she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And the Lord said, I want you to name the child Jezreel. For I'm about to punish King Jehu's dynasty to avenge the murders he committed at Jezreel. In fact, I will bring an end to Israel's independence. I will break its military power in the Jezreel Valley. So Gomer became pregnant again. And gave birth to a daughter this time. And the Lord said to Hosea, this time I want you to name your daughter Laruhamah, which means not loved. And I thought I had a weird first name. <laughs> Tequila? Tequila? Girl, your name means not loved. For I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But I will show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies, not with weapons and armies or horses and chariots, but by simply my power as the Lord their God. After Goma had weaned Laruhama, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. And, and the Lord said, name him 
Loami, which means not my people. For Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. So right out the gate, we see God speaking to this prophet and telling him that he wants Hosea to do something that seems very strange. Not just to Hosea, but to everybody around him. Can you imagine God saying to this young bachelor prophet preacher, Hey, Hosea, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news, you're going to get married. Woohoo! She's beautiful. Yes! She makes her own clothes. Yes! But the bad news is, she got a few character flaws. In fact, the really, really bad news is, she is a distracted person. She will become so distracted that she will abandon you for others, plural. But I want you to marry her anyway. I want you to marry this harlot, a.k.a. a wife of whoredom, a.k.a. a slur that is also used as an instrument in your garden. Mm -hmm. A hussy, a skeezer, a hooker, a tramp, a wench, a side piece. Do I need to go on? We good? Now I'm sure Hosea is scratching his head. Now say, what now, God? God, repeat it. Can you repeat that, please? Come again. Did you say wholesome or whoredom? Because God, what are people going to think when I show up with a whore? God, did you forget my entire job is designed to call people to turn to you? God, why can't I marry one of the other prophet's daughters? Isaiah's or Amos's daughter. Or they, they are good girls. They know what to do. They know how to act right. What, what about the girl next door to me? She seems like a lovely person. God, I can't bring this woman home and meet my mama. Are you sure about this, God? I'm sure Hosea's friends must have thought he has fallen and hit his head. Brother, don't you know this is Goma from round away? Gomer, you all have nothing in common. You're a prophet, a man of God. She's a prostitute, a woman of the night. You're a prophet, a lover of one. She's a prostitute, a lover of many. You're a prophet, saved for God. She's a prostitute, estranged from God. You're a prophet, a name known in time. She's a prostitute, a name known around town. Is this who you want to marry? You are a prophet who stands up for righteousness. She's a prostitute, bro, who lays down in unrighteousness. This is the person you're choosing? Can you imagine for one moment that conversation? Brothers and sisters, you have to agree with me that our text this morning is a strange relationship. The marriage of a prophet and a prostitute could possibly be complicated. This man, this prophet, represented faithfulness. He represented unfailing love for an unfaithful woman. And as we read his story, we discover that Hosea had more love than hatred. He had more blessings than bitterness, more patience than pity for his wife. Many of us, myself included, would have been in divorce court as soon or before the next episode of this show aired if I had to marry a prostitute. But Hosea was different. He knew she was going to cheat on him. He knew she was going to ultimately leave him. He knew she was going to go to work on Harry Hines or be featured on the main stage at the King of Diamonds or Magic City or Silver Dollars Gentleman's Club. I, I, I don't know if any of these places exist. The wild horse. Or, I don't. <laughs> he knew when he saw the children that she'd birthed that they didn't have his eyes or his ears. He knew she would eventually be with other men. But watch this. He married her and he loved her 
anyway. See, friends, we look at this story and we look at Hosea and we just shake our heads. What a chump. This poor dude. It's a shame he had to have such a whack marriage in order to be a sermon illustration. How awful is that? Poor guy. We, we're probably thinking all sorts of nasty thoughts about Gomer, especially if you've never read this book before. I hear your thoughts out loud about her. She gets the Academy Award for having a starring role on the Real Housewives of the Old Testament. <laughs> She's the villain. <laughs> the question that must be going through your minds, like it went through mine, why? Why, emoji? Why? Why? I mean, it's very juicy reading, this story, but, but why? And we see the answer in verse 2. God's response to the why is this. Put verse 2 back on the screen, Chris, for me, please. Verse 2, we read this. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, God said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children would be conceived in prostitution. But here goes the why. This will illustrate how Israel, put that in brackets, how Dallas, how Texas, put your address in there, put your zip code in there, how about put your name in there, has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods, little g. Hmm, that's the why. My people have left me, God says to Hosea, and your marriage to Gomer is designed to be a picture to my people of how they have abandoned me, even though I've taken them in as my own. Even though I have called them to be with me, even though I have been faithful to them, I have loved them, they still are not satisfied. See, wait a second, brothers and sisters, before we put our holier-than-thou halos on, and I get it by y'all's responses, you already in the halo mode, you got the halo vibe going on. I want you to realize that Hosea's crazy, mixed-up marriage isn't just about the children of Israel and their way with ways. It's a statement about each and every one of us. Yeah, I get it, I get it. You're thinking, how dare the Bible call me a prostitute? I've never been paid for sex. <sighs> do I, must, do, cause this ain't in the notes. I don't need to break that down for you, right? You don't need to get paid to still prostitute your heart. Ain't nobody got to give you a dime to turn away from the greatest love you've ever known. Maybe you didn't know that love, but the greatest love that ever existed. No one has to pay you to do that. You, you, we follow the little gods, little G, all on our own. We prostitute ourselves by the distractions that are around us and keeping us focused on what's before us. Yes, as shocking as it may seem, friends, we are the Gomers in this story. We are not Hosea. I know we like to read these narratives and we are in the hero portion of the story because that's how we like to see ourselves. Woo, look at us. Today God says, yes, look at you. Gomer, Gomer, Gomet, Gomer, Gomer. We're all Gomer in the story. God it's represented by Hosea. Yes, we are the adulterers, brothers and sisters. We are the harlots. We are the ones who are distracted from the love that is being poured out to us daily. And we get so distracted and so caught up with other things that we push God off to the peripheral, to the point that we have become blind to God. I'm not going to assume just because you're in a space that we call a sanctuary and today we call it a physical building called a church. I don't believe that just because you're in here, it means that somehow you have this amazing dynamic relationship with God. No, that doesn't mean anything. I can sleep in my garage tonight. That doesn't make me a car. Say amen, somebody. Brothers and sisters, God's desire is for us to remove the distractions and to come back to our first love. Ah, maybe you didn't love God first. God first loved you. To come back to the creator. 
to come back to the parent, to come back to the friend. Brothers and sisters, before we can fix any problem in our lives, we need to recognize what is wrong. And it's essential that we understand that the ways we are blind to God's love, yeah, there are ways in which we become blind to God's love. So in case you want to pretend like you're perfect, let me break it down to your perfect patty. Here we go. Here is a way that we become blind to God's love. We look to other things more than we look to God. This seems simple enough on the surface, but yet the problem is so deeply rooted in us that it becomes a blind spot towards God. See, the way Gomer got distracted, the way we get distracted, is by looking to other things and thinking that they are the reason why we are successful or they are the reason why I'm not making it so good on this earth. We look to other things and, and we begin to think that those other things somehow holds the power of our lives. But Hosea says in verse 8 why this is a mistake. God says you've been so distracted and so focused on things you think you are bringing success, things that are bringing you your careers, things that are bringing you your money, power. You relish on those things, your drugs, your alcohol, your good times. You relish in all of that without even noticing that it was me, God, who behind the scenes was the provision for every need you've ever had. Yeah, God, every, every need that was ever held up, everything that you ever need to be supported by, every love you've ever experienced was in fact because of me behind the scenes allowing it to happen. But, say but, but you've turned your back on me says God, and you chased after those things, which are just the resources, and you forgot the real source. And, and you've become so blinded and distracted by the bad choices that you've made that you can't seem to stop making one bad choice after another after another. You've become so distracted by the hard time that you're having right now in your life that, that you've forgotten my history as God that I took care of you before and I'll do it again. See, you forgot that. You've forgotten that even when you weren't thinking about how to breathe, I was putting breath in your body. You've wasted your time and your talents and, and you've sacrificed them to other little G gods. You put people, things, places as the central focus where I, God, the creator, the divine, deserves to be. Beloved, maybe for you, that other thing is your career, uh, maybe for you, it, it's that new home. Or maybe it's, it's an addiction. Or, or, or maybe it's, it's a relationship that never, ever seems to end that, that, that deep need for validation. And you will seek after validation, after validation, and you will connect with the wrong people because you will believe they are giving you the source of validation that you need, and they are not. they just as toxic as you are, but yet you keep chasing after them because they temporarily feel a need. Or the next uh, sale, perhaps, if you have a shopping issue. Or maybe it's the next deal if you got a, a, a gambling issue. Or whatever it is, the next high. Maybe it's the chase for that perfect relationship, which doesn't exist. Great relationships take work. Say amen, somebody. Maybe you've been chasing after that never-ending search for Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And you keep finding Miss Right now or Mr. Right now. They cute, but they not the one. Brothers and sisters, the problem is that maybe we've spent so much time and energy on the chase that we've made no time for God. So, you want to know one way that you could become blind to God? Looking to things or other people more than you look to God. Here's another way in case you still don't connect with that. We are blind to God when we are like Gomer, give a fraction of our attention for the moment to God until something better comes along, something more appealing, and we go after that. 
Hosea says that we are like Gomer when we try to fill our souls with stuff that is temporary and experiences that are meaningless. Then we find ourselves walking away from God and God becomes this afterthought until we need God again. Mm. Then God becomes the, in case of emergency, break the window. That's how we see God. And if that's how you see God, perhaps that's one way that you have been living in a blind spot. Maybe we're blind to God when we turn our attention, turn our relationship from God, with God, into a routine. A relationship into a routine. Let me explain. This is extremely significant because what Israel had done was reduce their relationship with God to a routine and ultimately it had become nothing more than people offering lip service to God. Simply going through the motions. It's Sunday, 1030, I got to show up. I show up, I look at the people, I raise my hand, I put in a penny in the offering basket, I go to Luby's, I go home, I watch football, and I go to bed, and I start it back all over again. No, sugar, that's a routine. That's not a relationship. Say amen, somebody. Simply going through the motions, and that is not what God desires. You see, when we become numb to God and distracted by other stuff, we start playing church rather than being the church. Let me preach right here. We start playing church rather than being the church. We show up because we think we're supposed to. You ain't supposed to. You show up because you want to. You show up because God has been good to you. You show up because you got something to thank God for, and you want to do it in a place where other like-minded people are also thanking God for whatever God has done for you. You ain't got to show up. You're here because you want to be here. Say amen, somebody. And when we're numb to God and distracted, we enter into the game of role-playing, pretending that we are Christ's followers. When in fact, we are everything but that. I ain't looking at nobody and neither do you. Just keep your eyes up here. When we're numb to God and distracted, we push God so far back out of our sight into our blind spots that we don't even see God anymore or the things of God any longer. And all we see is all the mess that we're in and all we see is the gossip and the hate and the hate and the more hate and the foolishness that happens on the internet, the public place where people who got very low IQs happen to be able to have an opinion. And then we keep responding back to those people. Low IQ people need love too. But do we need to be fighting with folk online? No. That's a distraction. Say distraction. distraction. Oh, I'm trying to give you something light and easy. I can get down in your business, but the Holy Spirit is saying, keep going, sis, keep going. They ain't ready for it if you get down in their business, so just go and keep preaching. Maybe you've turned your relationship into a routine with God. Or maybe you have no clue what it means to have a relationship because you've just shown up Sunday after Sunday because your parents instilled that in you. Well, good for your parents. I want to let you know there's something more. There's something more than just showing up. That, that's what you've always done, what you were taught to do. But, but yours as moved or as changed as if I was watching paint dry on the wall. It's just a routine. It has no meaning. It has no value for your life. And, and then you're, you're missing the focus of what God wants for your life. I can't tell you how many people I encounter today who, who say, I used to go to church or I used to have a relationship with God. And if I am so inclined, I'll say, tell me more about used to. Well, where are you right now? Oh, well, you know, I don't really believe anymore. I don't practice it anymore. How come? Well, because somebody said something at church once and it really rubbed me the wrong way and I just never went back. Okay, so your routine got disrupted and so then you stopped your routine. See, when you got a relationship with God, I don't give a damn what you say about me. I'm still going to worship God. I don't care. I, I don't care. I don't care. 
Because my relationship with God is the connection that I have to sustain my life. And without being connected to God, I promise you I'm not a very good person. I promise you I am not at my best when I'm not allowing the divine to pour inside of me and accept what God has poured inside of me and then push it back out so that I can help the world to see a beacon of light that really isn't me. It is a force that's greater than me. But that took time. That relationship took time to develop. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't. I remember the first time I really committed my life to Christ. The, I'm saying the first time because I was born into a family of faith. I, I don't even remember being baptized. That's how little I was, right? And I was always raised in a household where my mother was Catholic, my daddy was Protestant. There's no way I should have been going to hell. But it was possible, right? Because I didn't have a relationship with God. All I knew was rituals. All I knew was a routine. But then one day, my high school buddy showed up on Christmas Eve at our home. And we're talking, and he said, yeah, you know, I've become a Christ follower. I was like, what's that mean? Well, it, it means that I, I, I'm saved. Oh, Lord. That means you date girls who wear long skirts and no makeup. Does that mean you don't ever cuss again? He's like, it doesn't mean any of that. I said, what does it mean? He pulls a little New Testament pocket Bible out of his pocket. Read right here. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Amen. Period. I said, that's it? He said, that's it. Have you done that? I said, no. Why not? Nobody ever asked. So in my parents' kitchen... I committed my life to Christ on my own terms, on my own accord. But it took time, say it took time, to have a relationship with God where I could start to listen to God and discern what God was saying because I was still a newbie, zealous Christian, and then I remember, you know, it's Christmas time, so the next Christmas I'm telling my parents, I am not teaching my children about Santa Claus. Oh, are there any children in here? Chris, we safe? Can I, are we good? Okay, I am not, I ain't teaching my children about no Santa Claus. And my father was like, oh, what? Santa Claus has never done anything to you. Santa Claus is what you learned about. What's wrong with Santa Claus? Come on, Daddy. You know, I want to teach my, people, my children about Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Whoa, did we have a fight. And the fight led, ended with, well, I won't teach your children about Santa Claus and Jesus. I said, oh, okay. But the reality is, that wasn't no fight I needed to be in. But once I became a mature Christian, somebody who stopped drinking just milk, I, I began to understand what really matters. So when somebody says something about me that I don't agree with, that has to do with my relationship, I'm not moved. I'm not phased. Doesn't mean I don't care. It means I don't care. <laughs> when you have a relationship with God, it changes your insides out. Uh, maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you think it's still cool to just throw a little few bucks in the plate of offering every now and again out of routine, but it's meaningless. But I want you to know that your gifts really do help to change lives. And if you put your mentality along with that, if you changed your thinking, I promise you, you'd see the benefits of your labor, the benefits of your generosity, that your generosity goes way farther than you can think or imagine. It's much more than a buck inside of a plate. In God's hand, that buck turns into a whole lot, and it does a whole lot with people for people who have a little. We preached about that last weekend. Let me get on back to Gomer and Hosea. When we act out of routine, we don't pray about stuff that really does affect us. We, we don't pray about big things or little things. We just show up and life and let's see what happens. When, when you just go through a routine, you will see that in times of trouble, 
it's really hard to lean in to faith. 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 The substance of something that's hoped for but that is not seen. Faith. It's really hard to lean into what is meaningful and what will help you to be planted solidly or to help anchor you when what you have is just a routine. Brothers and sisters, it's God's desire that we are deeply acquainted and attached to God. I'm going to say that again. It is God's desire that we are deeply acquainted and attached to God. And if you're thinking, well, God knows everything about me. True, but what do you know about God? See, relationships go both ways, right? I don't just hook up with somebody and, oh, they know everything about me. Okay, what's their favorite color? I, I don't know. Uh, what street did they grow up on? I don't know that either. What religion are they? Mm -hmm. What do you know about this person other than they know about you? Well, I, I don't know. Nobody wants to be in a one-sided relationship. Say amen, somebody. The prophet Hosea is calling us back to a deep relationship because God has promised faithfulness to us. Even when we wander away, like Gomer. Gomer wanders so far away, brothers and sisters, that by chapter 3, she has literally sold herself into a relationship with another man and has become his concubine, his, his um, SEX slave. She literally sold her body to another man while she's still married to Hosea. Please read this story. In chapter 3, we learn that Hosea is then called by God to do something radical. God, you called me to marry this woman who we know was a prostitute. God, you called me to have children with this chick who we know was a prostitute. And now she didn't ran off. I'm here with these babies, Lahore Ruaham and La Mimi and all the others. And, <laughs> and, and word on the street is she didn't want to sold herself to somebody else. Hosea has every legal and moral right to divorce her. And under the law, in that time, he has the right to actually have her life ended. But Hosea is not about the law. That's not what this book is about. This book, Hosea, is about love. And because of love, Hosea does something that is unthinkable. Spoiler alert. Following God's instructions, Hosea goes out to this slave trade market where they got people that are selling, have been bought and sold and bought and sold. And there he sees his wife, his woman, his bride, Gomer, with this other man. And what does he do? He purchases her back with his own resources. Did you hear me? This man had already given vows to this woman. This man had already exchanged rings with this woman. This man already had a home with this woman. This man already knew that I'm yours and you are mine, yet you wandered off from me and look at the trouble you're in. But guess what? I love you so much that I'm willing to buy back what's already mine. You already belong to me, but I'm going to purchase you back. And I do it because of my love for you. Brothers and sisters, catch this. God tells Hosea to go and literally purchase back that which was already his, his own wife, with his own money. Go and do whatever it takes to get her back, even in the midst of her unfaithfulness. And this, God says, is what I have done and what I will do for each and every one of my people. It doesn't matter how far you wander away. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. 
That is exactly what this whole thing is about. This that we call a book, Old Testament, New Testament, this, brothers and sisters, is God's witness to how far God will go to love us, how far God will go to show us God's love. If you think this book is just about the do-nots, oh, baby boy, baby girl, look at it a little differently. This book starts with a love story, and it ends with a love story. And in the middle, there's a book called Hosea about some people, you and I, named Gomer, who wander away from God's amazing grace and God's amazing love. And God says, I'm going to I'll find you in the crack house, and I'm going to bring you back. I'll find you in the, in the, in the gambling parlor, and I'm going to bring you back. I, I will find you in the depths of your darkness, in your depression, and I'm going to walk with you so that I can help bring you back. What? You went to jail? Okay, cool. I know how to show up in the courtroom and be an advocate for you so that mercy and grace can prevail in your situation. Oh, you in the hospital? No problem. I will heal her too. I will heal you and I will bring you back because you are mine and I am yours and I love you with an everlasting love. Amen. Strange story. Absolutely. And that's the heartbeat of our faith. Of our faith narrative. Our, our narrative is not about hate. If you hear hate attached with this message, you are not hearing truth. I'm going to say it again. If you hear or something senses and start, your body senses start going off, because you're like, wait, that don't sound right. That sounds like hate. That sounds like discord. That sounds like people being infringed and putting, putting people in the margins of life. That sounds like overlooking folk. That sounds like disrespecting people. Then you're not hearing about faith. I, I, that's some other stuff. But this faith is a faith of love. Why? Because we serve a God who is love. So every time I use the word God, you can insert the word love because that's who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about persecution. I'm not talking about revenge. I get it. That's what some of you think about God. But God says, I, I love you, and, and I'm going to win you back. God doesn't say, I'm going to cast you off forever. Because that's what happened with Israel. When you keep reading the story, God gets them back. They strayed away. We stray away. Maybe we've never known. And today is the day where God is like, I am here with you. Even though we may have forgotten God, I want you to know today God has not forgotten us. Amen. And God will do whatever God needs to do to speak to us and to show God's love and God's grace. And to many people, that might seem strange. But remember, brothers and sisters, Hosea's story was not the first illustration of God's demonstration of love and faithfulness to God's people. It was a strange thing when God asked Abraham to slay his own son, Isaac. That was strange. It was strange when God told Moses to stretch out his rod over the Red Sea and the waters parted so that they could go through him. It was a strange thing, brothers and sisters, when, when we consider all of the things that God has done when God spoke through the mouth of a donkey to save somebody's life. It was a strange thing when the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro were inside of a fiery furnace. Hebrew, black, all the same thing. <laughs> but they remained unharmed. It was a strange thing for God to ask Noah to build a three football field length boat. And it hadn't rained one drop. You want to talk about stranger things? God asked the prophet Ezekiel to lie down on his left side for 390 days and on his right side for 40 more days. I want you to know tempur could never make a mattress comfortable <laughs> enough for that strange request. But to some, the strangest thing of all was a teenager who was a virgin, whose name was Mary. 
showed up pregnant through immaculate conception. And the part of the story that's even more strange is that the dude she was betrothed to, she was engaged to, to marry, he knew that she was pregnant, and he heard God say, marry her anyway. And, and you're going to help parent the child she'll give birth to. Oh, and by the way, the baby she's going to give birth to, I'm the baby's daddy, says God. <laughs> Not only am I the baby's daddy, I, I am God inside of her. And the part of me that's in her, you will know as Emmanuel, Jesus, God, always with you. And that child is going to turn out to not just be your little baby in a manger. That child is, is being born for a certain reason. That child you're going to love from day one, protect. That child you're going to nurture, you're going to care for that child. And that child's going to grow up to not just be your son, but to be the savior of this world. Talk about a strange thing. Oh, stranger things, they keep going in our story. The baby Jesus who was born, whose, whose birth date we wait to celebrate during the season of Advent, was born in order that he would ultimately die. He was born in order that he could die. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a strange story. That this same God so loved the world, that world, you and me, that that God gave his own. One and only son as a sacrifice for the world, including you and me. Uh, the same sacrifice, we name it Jesus. I call love. Persecuted, bled, died, suffered. And was raised from the dead. N not 20 minutes later. Not, not two hours later. No, three days later. Hmm. Yeah, that's a strange story, ain't it? But brothers and sisters, the beauty of the story is that Christ's death and resurrection is the biggest metaphor and example of what can die in our life that is no good for us in order that what is good can be raised to life, in order that we might have a new life, in order that we might have a new vision, a new vantage point, a new perspective, a new position. You might have been a prostitute, but now you're the prophet. You might have been someone who'd gone astray, but now you're the one that's come home. To share with others this home is for you and you and you and you. God invites all of us to come and experience God's grace and God's mercy. You know, one of the things we love to do at Lyft is to love people. And I believe that God is calling us back all over to love God through loving people. That's how the kingdom's blessings get down to earth through others. It's through us. We pray that for all the time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. How do you think God's will gets to be operational on earth? It's through us. Although I saw an Instagram this week of a little child who prayed that prayer and he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Howard is your name. <laughs> I said, the mama was taking a video. I said, girl, correct your baby. This is a good time to teach him. But I thought it was funny. The way our brains interpret certain things about God. And today I believe God says, interpret me as love. Because that's who I am. I am love. Friend, we can't serve people sacrificially or love generously or give radically if we're not do it, doing it in the name of love. Well, you know, you, you can show kindness, kind acts. But for it to truly mean something for you, 
is when you do it because you are the reflection of God to the earth. When we aren't, aren't fully consumed by God's sacrificial and generous and radical love and forgiveness, we cannot offer that to others. I can forgive because I've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Now today the question is from God, will you turn back to me? Will you become deeply attached to me? Because I long to be attached to you. That's the question. Will you come back to God? Our band is coming back on the stage, but in your hearts, I want you to consider that question. What needs to change in your life? This is the prayer for this week. What is it that needs to change in your life so that God can become the central part? Maybe it's a lot of things. Maybe it's one thing. Maybe God is not in your blind spot. Maybe God's just off a little bit to the left or the right. What do you need to do in order for God to be the center of your life again? Or for the first time. Maybe you've been drawing on your own energy source to try to fix things and, and work things out, and it hasn't wor worked for you. Well, because the human capacity is limited. The divine is unlimited. What is it that you need to do in order for the divine to have place in your life? Place where you can witness God in your life. Not just the, in case of emergency, break the hammer and pray. Break the glass and say, okay, God, I need you right now. That's a prayer. But how about every day just saying thank you? That's a better prayer. So then when you do need God right now, God, I thank you that I needed you right now. I needed you yesterday and today and the day before that and the day before that. And I'm going to need you tomorrow. And I trust that you will show up. Amen. What is it in your life? that needs to be repositioned so that your relationship with God can grow. 